Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, despite the rain. Uh, and happy uh, philosophy day, the world philosophy day. So it's kind of fortunate that we have a philosophy talk today. Um, so our speaker uh, for tonight is Diane O'Leary. Uh, she works in uh, philosophy, I would say philosophy of medicine, but she does many things. Uh, she's working in history of philosophy, and metaphysics, and all kinds of things. Uh, she's recently focused a lot on uh, on the, the mind-body relationship in medicine, and she's going to talk to about this uh, part to, to today, tonight. Um, so before, so Diane is visiting the Rotman Institute. She's been visit, visiting the Rotman Institute for about a year, but before that, she was at the Brochure Foundation in Geneva, and she's also uh, was a, a researcher at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics. Uh, where is the Kennedy Institute of Ethics again? Georgetown, Georgetown. Washington. Yeah, Washington yeah. Yeah. And so, without further ado, uh, please welcome Diane O'Leary. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about all in your head uh, in medicine. Um, what I'm, I'm going to uh, do this talk in four parts. First, I'm going to talk about uh, some facts about objective medical evidence in medicine. Those are a bit scary. Then I'm going to talk about what we're doing with those facts in everyday medicine. And I'll talk about how patients are responding to what we're doing uh, with this. And then at the end, I'm going to explain how the problem is actually a matter of philosophy. Before I do that, though, I just want to head off some uh, common preconceptions about doctors and philosophers. So this is a doctor. <laughs> and uh, she's very smart and uh, very intelligent and very practical, very good at putting her intelligence to use in the practical realm uh, for the benefit of others. This is a philosopher. Um, this is Thales, who's often said to be the first philosopher. That's actually kind of hard to determine. But uh, Thales was famous for saying, everything is water and everything will return to water. Uh, but Thales was also famous for falling into a well um, <laughs> because he was so distracted by his thoughts about philosophy. And uh, he actually fell into a well full of water. <laughs> so, um, so people tend to think philosophy, you know, head in the clouds, medicine, a very practical uh, enterprise where we, we work really hard to apply our thinking to the practical world. Um, but I just want to start by suggesting that uh, medicine is always grounded in abstract philosophical ideas, even though it's true that philosophers fall into wells. Um, the ground of medicine is philosophical. So back when we were doing the four humors in medicine, that was based on preconceptions about the nature of the world, the nature of science, the nature of bodies, the nature of mind, the nature of human character. And uh, as medicine became more as it is today, uh, this is no less the case. So uh, some of you might be familiar with this uh, famous painting. This is uh, Charcot, who was a teacher of Freud. And this uh, swooning woman, uh, has hysteria um, in this um, painting. And this is uh, Charcot talking about the female malady of hysteria and explaining that as a mind-body problem that women uniquely suffer from. And of course, all of this, you know, this is the edge of biological science. And so all of this depends deeply on our assumptions about minds and bodies and gender and all kinds of things like that. Even though it certainly looks like science, um, looks like medicine. So I'm going to suggest today specifically that um, philosophical ideas about subjectivity and objectivity in medicine actually have a direct impact on what doctors do in everyday medical practice. And I'm going to suggest that uh, in cases where patients have symptoms that don't yield objective evidence through diagnostic tests and exams, confusion about the nature of subjectivity and objectivity has led to and continues to lead to substantial practical physical harm uh, for people. So even though I am an abstract philosopher, um, 
the idea is that you change the foundations, the way that we think about what medicine is, what medical science is, and uh, through doing that, you change the practices that actually affect um, patients in need of care. So the scary truth about objective medical evidence. My dad has a pacemaker, and um, this is quite an incredible diagnostic tool, right? You, he has this uh, little machine in his chest and this little machine next to his bed, and from time to time, all the, every heartbeat that got recorded in the chest gets downloaded as information onto the little thing by the bed, and then from time to time, the doctor uploads all of that stuff into her own system and analyzes the data and decides what to do next with his care. None of this requires any action on his part, or you know, the doctor can know it's all wireless and everything. So this is brave new world kind of stuff, right? This is what diagnostic medicine looks like in our time. That little thing there is a sort of a colonoscopy in a pill. Where you take the pill and it takes pictures all the way down, and uh, in the you know those pictures get downloaded to information on a belt and such and so. So this all seems so advanced and so intensely scientific that we tend to think that medicine in our time is really about gathering objective evidence and using this objective evidence to make decisions about diagnosis. And we also tend to think that, well, holy cow, look at these technologies. We must be really, really great at this now, right? Medical science has become so good at these kinds of uh, at diagnostic techniques. So the way we normally see it is that this has a four-step process. You have a medical issue, you go to see a doctor. The patient reports her subjective bodily experience to the doctor. Then the doctor uses that to go and do some objective tests. The doctor gathers some objective evidence from a hands-on exam or from diagnostic tests. Based on that objective evidence, she makes a diagnosis and then the patient and doctor consider treatment options. So this kind of goes without saying, this is just how we do it, right? The thing is that this third step actually fails in a very, very large portion of cases. The reason that it fails, the reason that we don't get diagnostic, diagnosis in many cases is because there is no objective evidence. The doctor looks into, the patient has a subjective experience, the doctor looks into it with objective diagnostic tests and hands-on exam, finds absolutely nothing. As a result of that, the patient and the doctor cannot consider any treatment options, and so what you end up with is just a patient reporting a subjective experience and a medical professional going, well, what do we do then, right? So most of us tend to think, well, okay, that might happen from time to time, but medicine, we normally get the diagnosis right. I mean, for goodness sake, look at those very advanced diagnostic techniques we have now. Most people would tend to think, okay, 84, 85% of the time, we probably get the diagnosis. Sure, all in your heads, you know, undiagnosed symptoms, that happens from time to time, but that's gotta be a really small portion of everyday medicine, because we're so good at this now, right? In 1989, Kroenke and Mangelsdorf uh, did a study where they tracked the 14 most common symptoms in outpatient care in 1,000 patient records. And what they found was that even though diagnostic testing was performed in two-thirds of the cases, they found objective evidence only 16% of the time. This study was important, and then there were a gazillion other studies that similarly showed that most of the time in everyday medicine, we actually don't get any objective evidence. So the way that we normally see the balance of cases that get diagnosed and the balance of cases that don't get diagnosed could be quite the opposite. According to that study, it's 84% of the time, no objective evidence. So I should say that that's a very high figure. So there've been thousands and thousands of studies on the prevalence of symptoms like this, which we call medically unexplained symptoms. That's what they're called in medicine, uh, or MUS. So essentially, whatever figure you happen to prefer for the prevalence of unexplained symptoms in medicine, you could find a research study that said that. Because um, research in this area is 
terminologically ambiguous and statistically kind of confused. Um, so uh, in a 2016 review article, you find the conclusion that only 10 to 15% of symptoms are medically unexplained. Then there's another study that says, depending on how you define it, only 4% are medically unexplained. So that would mean 96% of the time we do get evidence, right? So a whole wide range of conclusions there. But uh, what matters in this context is the way that medicine itself sees um, the lack of objective evidence. So this is a chart that I just pulled directly from um, a, a, a practice guideline in the UK um, where medically unexplained symptoms are said to be uh, present in 52% of outpatients. And this is current. This is the guideline that directs health policy in the UK. So in the UK, more than half of patients have symptoms that are not explained by diagnostic testing. That's a really high figure, roughly 50%. We have a medical research review system in the US. It's actually kind of global, called Up to Date. And it allows uh, clinicians to, right, when the patient's right there with them in the exam room, somebody has kidney stones, the doctor's unsure. Wait, what was the most recent thing I read about diagnosing kidney stones? She puts kidney stones into the search engine there for up to date and gets a very quick overview of what the current research says about diagnosing and treating kidney stones. It's very up to date, it's very uh, concise, and it never goes out on a limb. Uh, the up to date research review system informs clinicians that objective evidence is lacking for more than 50% of patients, uh, this is also current, who present to outpatient uh, clinics with a medical complaint. So more than half the time when you go to the doctor, according to up to date, no objective evidence at all. So what is going on in these cases? This is, is scary. This is scary for doctors who I think often feel that when they don't figure it out, they have failed. And this is scary for patients because patients think, well, I came to you because you're a scientist and you can use your science to help me feel better. And here we are, you don't have a clue what's going on. How in the world are you gonna make me better? This is a very scary situation, and it's not surprising that the general public and the medical community both kind of <laughs> put this information to the side. This isn't something that people want to know. So what actually goes on in these kinds of cases? What do clinicians actually do when they're confronted with this very, very large portion of patients where they can't figure out, where they don't have any objective evidence for what's going on? So let's look at what the status quo is with cases of this kind. There is an area of medicine that is specifically devoted to addressing symptoms that lack objective evidence, and that is a field not of medicine, but of psychiatry called psychosomatic medicine. So practice guidelines, medical education, uh, medical training, research summaries, all of that information that tells people in medicine how to handle cases that, that lack of objective evidence comes from this field of psychiatry called psychosomatic medicine, which uh, in the US is now called the field of consultation liaison psychiatry uh, because patients find the term psychosomatic medicine to be offensive. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so here's the truth about the, what it actually says in the up-to-date research system. Up-to-date doesn't just say 50% of the symptoms lack objective evidence. Based on all of these maybe 30, 40 years of research in the field of psychosomatic medicine, what it says in up-to-date is more than 50% of patients presenting to outpatient medical clinics with a physical complaint do not have a medical condition. Um, so if you go, if you're a doctor, and let's say you're a young doctor or a nurse or physician's assistant, and you have a lot of patients with unexplained symptoms, no objective tests, you're not sure what to do, you type that into up to date, you are immediately routed out of medicine into psychiatry. You don't get a choice about that. 
Medic unexplained symptoms, entry in psychiatry, where you find this statement that says, more than half of your patients are not ill. Um, they're, they're just, you know, they think that they have a medical problem, but they don't. So what's confusing here is that there is no research that leads us from the lack of objective evidence to you don't have a medical condition. In up to date, clinicians are expected to see that as obvious. That's confusing. The uh, foundations for psychosomatic medicine really come from the United Kingdom. Um, hard to say why that's the case. Um, but psychiatry in the, in the UK has a, a very, very strong influence on the way that clinicians all over the world handle symptoms that lack objective evidence. And if you go to the website for the Royal College of Psychiatrists today, now, and you look up medically unexplained symptoms, you'll find this definition. Symptoms can be called medically unexplained symptoms because they are not due to a physical illness in the body. However, they can be explained, but to do this, we need to think about causes that are not physical. So what's <laughs> happening here is that the term medically unexplained symptoms is actually being defined to mean you're not actually ill. So we're not getting any science that tells us how we get from I didn't understand it to there's nothing there. We're just getting a definition that stipulates that when you're lacking objective evidence, there's no medical problem there at all. So in the World Health Organization uh, diagnostic manual that's used around the globe, Unexplained symptoms are classified as a psychiatric problem in the primary care manual. So this is the guidance that physicians receive for what you're supposed to say. Uh, you've been worried about your health because you have symptoms for which no physical cause can be found. It's important for you to know this doesn't mean that you're really not experiencing these symptoms. It means there's something wrong, but it's not caused by physical problems. So again, I didn't get any evidence, so not a physical problem. What is the tie that links those two? In the DSM, this is the Diagnostic Manual for uh, Psychiatry, the construct of MUS develops right around the time that the idea of psychiatric explanations for symptoms first enters uh, the field of psychiatry. So right around the 1980s, you get this new category of stuff called somatoform disorders that say when people are physically ill, but you can't figure out what's wrong with them, you can use this construct in psychiatry to explain that. This is the first time this enters the diagnostic manual. The idea of medically unexplained symptoms is closely tied to that idea. Um, but medically unexplained symptoms are so very common that if you diagnose everybody with, the medical, with a mental health condition, we would all be mentally ill, right? So uh, because everybody, this has happened so often that uh, everybody would ultimately be said to have a, a mental health disorder. So most people with this kind of problem don't get a full mental health diagnosis. But again, you would think, all right, so in the DSM, they must explain what's the tie between not getting the, the tests, any results on tests, and assuming that there's no disease there. They must explain that somewhere in the DSM, right? There's got to be a gold standard there that tells us how you get from one to the other. But again, in the DSM, clinicians are expected to see that tie as self-evident. There's no scientific account. I'm going to skip that one. So uh, psychiatric labels for medically unexplained symptoms are very abundant. Somatic symptom disorder in the recent edition of the manual, functional neurological disorder, all these ones in bold are coming out in the next year or year and a half in the International Classification of Diseases. These are new ways of classifying symptoms that are caused by psychiatric problems. These are the old ones, somatoform disorders, conversion disorder. It all comes down to hysteria in the end. That's where it all uh, kind of comes from. But in none of these do we get an explanation for why symptoms that, haven't, that don't show up on diagnostic tests should be understood to not be caused by disease. So here is the challenge that we're dealing with. The patient has a subjective experience. She relays it to the doctor who looks for objective evidence, finds no objective evidence. And then because there's a lack of objective evidence, the doctor assumes there's no disease, where the practice guidelines encourage her to assume that a lack of objective evidence is the same as an absence of disease. So this is what we're going to ask. This is what I'm going to try to address. 
What's going on? Why? Why would anyone think that a lack of objective evidence is the same as an absence of disease? What leads clinicians to find that idea compelling? The reason that this is confusing, of course, is because when patients have symptoms, assuming that disease is not present, that's an extremely risky conclusion, right? So you would expect medical science to be extra cautious about that one. So it's really odd that practice in this area is meant to be self-evident. And of course, the tie between a lack of objective evidence and absence of disease, it's not self-evident because there are a whole lot of medical conditions that don't lead to objective evidence. Sudden infant death syndrome. Infants suddenly die in the crib, uh, but these infants meet the standards for <laughs> medical unexplained symptoms, uh, which would clinically force you to say that there's nothing actually wrong there, but of course they die, right? Uh, same chronic traumatic encephalopathy, that's the uh, disease that football players get or women who are victims of domestic violence get hit in the head a lot. Um, when patients are alive, you can't find that on tests. You can only find those, that problem in autopsy, but of course that's a life-threatening problem, right? So there's a ton of conditions that should lead you to think, okay, when you don't have objective evidence, people can still be very seriously ill, right? So what is going on here? Why in the world would medical science accept that? Um, before I answer that question, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how the public is responding to this area of medicine um, and how we can find error in that process. So uh, this, one, this woman's face, I don't know how well you can see that in this light. This woman's face really kind of says it all. I, I was thinking I could just show this light and, and go home. <laughs> this is not going well. Um, this woman has symptoms. Uh, she says to the doctor, you know, I have this pain. And I said, pain, it really hurts. I can't go to work. It's terrible. Doctor says, well, I, I did lots of tests. There's nothing there. Um, have you been stressed? Is there something else going on in your life? And the woman's response is, is this, right? Patients very often respond with, what? Why are you doing that, right? What do you... What? Just because you can't find something, why in the world would you think that means there's nothing there, right? So medical and explained symptoms are the number one source of conflict between patients and doctors in outpatient care. So if you go to the doctor, your doctor doesn't find anything, you get mad, you say, come on now, just because you didn't find anything doesn't mean I'm not sick. You and your doctor tussle. Most of the time patients think that that was unusual. I shouldn't have tussled with my doctor. My doctor's mad at me. That never happens. No, no, no. This is the number one source of conflict between patients and doctors. This happens all day in the clinic. In research, doctors describe encounters with MUS patients as a tug of war, a duet of escalating antagonism, a medieval siege. That's my favorite. So patients get mad when doctors follow these guidelines, right? For this reason, a really large portion of the research in psychosomatic medicine is about how to avoid this conflict. And in fact, a lot of the guidelines suggest that if you avoid this conflict, the patient will get better. Uh, so it's not a small thing. People are not happy with the way this works. Part of that is that the public generally knows this whole long pile of diseases that used to be considered psychosomatic that turned out to be serious problems. Epilepsy, syphilis, MS, lupus, peptic ulcers. Parkinson's disease at one point was attributed to anger because people were doing that, right? Uh, menstrual cramps, nausea and pregnancy, endometriosis. Actually, psychosomatic gynecology is still thriving um, in our time. But all of these conditions were once considered to be psychosomatic. The public knows that and knows that that turned out to be an error. In current culture, if you have serious long-term condition that is not resolved on medical tests, the doctor says, well, can't be anything wrong with you. I didn't see anything on the test. You go and you look around on the internet, you find out very quickly, patients with autoimmune disease say, yeah, I had that problem, then it turned out I had an autoimmune disease. So more than half of patients with autoimmune disease report that this has happened, where the doctor has said, I didn't get it, 
must be psychological, and then patients turned out to have autoimmune disease, more than half of them. In rare disease, same thing. Studies show a really strong tie. Uh, rare disease patients wait on average five years for diagnosis, and it shows that the time period to get a diagnosis of a rare disease is at least double and up to seven times longer if a doctor attributes it to your psyche at some point. So there's a very, very strong tie there, too. And you see this all over the internet, people with rare disease saying, yeah, the doctor said I wasn't sick, and it turned out I had this rare disease, right? How common is that? Rare diseases are rare, right? No, no, no. Rare disease is as common as diabetes. Rare diseases are not rare when you take them collectively. Autoimmune diseases are very common. If you take the most conservative estimates of prevalence for these two conditions, uh, there are, and, and this is based on just assuming that only half of rare disease patients suffer from this problem, you get 12 million patients in the US alone for whom disease, serious disease, has been mistakenly attributed to the psyche, just in these two groups, just these two groups. So the public is becoming aware of this problem. The internet is making it possible for people to talk to one another about it. The example of all in your head, psychosomatic illness that most people know best is this thing that people call chronic fatigue syndrome. Patients know it as myalgic encephalomyelitis. Uh, so you sometimes see this acronym ME slash CFS to uh, label this disease. In the 80s and 90s, people referred to it as yuppie flu. It's also been called neurasthenia. And of course, all of the way that this condition <laughs> has been managed, as I keep saying over and over, uh, comes from the notion of hysteria, because chronic fatigue syndrome primarily uh, or predominantly affects women. So since the 1980s, chronic fatigue syndrome has been, cons has been used not just as one of the conditions that we can attribute to the psyche because we're lacking evidence to explain it. Psychosomatic medicine as a field has been founded on the example of chronic fatigue syndrome. So uh, studies that show mental health treatment works for unexplained symptoms are usually tried on patients with chronic fatigue syndrome. Most of the research that you find that encourages this kind of practice where you treat unexplained symptoms with psychiatry, most of them ultimately refer back in some way to research done on chronic fatigue syndrome or MECFS. But it turned out that in 2015, the National Academy of Sciences, the NIH, and the CDC said, oh, no, uh, that, whoops, no, 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 no. That's actually a very serious biological disease. We were wrong about that. Uh, so they are now uh, united in that conclusion. The NIH, the CDC, the HHS, the National Academy of Sciences are united in the conclusion that that was an error. Um, MECFS is a serious biological disease. Um, within Canada, there's been a lot of debate about that and a lot of um, tussling within the health system. But recently, uh, the government awarded a million dollar grant uh, for biological research into MECFS. Um, so it seems that the debate there is shifting. So what you have here is, you know, yuppie flu, this is like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're all tired. Yeah, sure, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, we're all tired. Nothing shows up on the test, so how could you actually be ill? The patients involved in this, the patients with this disease, the patients in this community have been so active in the public realm in demanding medical care that this has changed the way that the public deals with the field of medicine, with the profession of medicine. This is a millions missing sticker. It says there, we'd be marching in protest, but we're too sick. Ask us why. Uh, MECFS is a multi-system disease that affects approximately 580,000 Canadians of all ages. This just came out in October 2019. If you had looked for the same information in October 2018, it would have told you that patients with MECFS suffer from a psychiatric condition. Um, same thing in the U.S. According to the CDC, there are more than a million people in the U.S. with this condition, and maybe as many as 24 million across the world. 
So again, it's hard to uh, overstate how central this condition has been to the field of psychosomatic medicine. And so it's hard to overstate how impactful it's been for people in this patient community to make a public statement and a public demand for medical care as they have. Um, Miriam Tucker published a, a really helpful article in NPR that explains, the panel says chronic fatigue syndrome is a disease and renames it. So the IOM has called it systemic in exertion intolerance disease, but people continue to debate about the right disease. This is what an MECFS protest looks like. They call it a millions missing march. These are all the shoes. Each pair of shoes represents someone who cannot march. Um, these occur every year uh, in May around the world. They look like this. And um, this kind of activism, this idea of I'm seriously ill and just because you don't see objective evidence, you're not helping me. This has, the activism for MECFS has been successful and the techniques have become common. So at this time, the MECFS community, fibromyalgia, multiple chemical sensitivity, the ones from autoimmune disease and rare disease, IBS, Lyme disease, which you hear about a lot, Ehlers-Danlos, thyroid disorders, vestibular disorders, endometriosis, autonomic disorders, all of these patient communities are starting to follow the techniques and approaches of the MECFS community because all of these communities say, we have diseases. <laughs> The medical community is following these guidelines that suggest when you don't have objective evidence, you're not actually ill. And this is not working for us. We, we need help, right? These people are starting to communicate with one another and to develop techniques that pressure the medical system into change. And this is a very, very different, this, this phenomenon between the public and the medical profession is new. It's changing things. The thing to notice here is that most of these conditions affect women more than men. And this is a really big part of why this push is gaining such power in the public. Research on gender inequity in medicine has now established that when women have the same symptoms as men, uh, the same threat of disease, the same um, the same kinds of uh, contextual situations, women cannot access the same level of health care that men access. So can't access the same tests, can't access the same treatments, the same surgeries, all kinds of uh, areas of medical care. This has been shown to be the case in cardiac care, in pain management, joint replacement, stroke care, and cancer diagnosis. So at this time, there is absolutely no question that women have trouble gaining equal access to health care. Why does this occur? Most of the research in this area suggests, well, doctors have subtle personal biases about women's health and about women who are ill, and they just tend to assume that women's symptoms are not genuine or, you know, maybe it's hysteria, this kind of thing. In reality, Directives from psychosomatic, from psychosomatic medicine actually tell doctors directly to do this. So it's not a matter of subtle personal bias. What it says for somatic symptom disorder in the current psychiatric diagnostic manual is females tend to present with somatic symptom disorder more often than men with an estimated female to male ratio of 10 to 1. Somatic symptom disorder means you're not actually ill. You think you are, but you're not. So what this says is diagnose men with medical conditions 10 times more often than women. It actually says to do that. Not subtle. Not personal bias. The thing is, if you look this up in studies, you will find thousands of studies that show women suffer from psychosomatic conditions way more often than men. But if you think about what those studies actually show you, what they actually say is that doctors, as a matter of fact, diagnose women with these kinds of conditions way more often than they diagnose men. But none of the studies show 
that that's a good idea. The only way to determine whether there's actually a gender bias there is to study gender bias in diagnosis of this kind. But there haven't been any studies of that kind. There haven't been any revisions made to that 10 to 1 thing, which is still all, all over the medical education, um, all over the internet. If you look up somatic symptom disorder gender, you'll find that 10 to 1 is current. The general public is becoming aware that women have trouble accessing medical care. And the general public is becoming aware that women's health conditions are very often attributed to the psyche, right? So even though they don't quite realize that the field of psychosomatic medicine is telling clinicians to do this, the general public is starting to develop a movement around women's health and about um, medicine dismissing women's symptoms. So there was this article in The Atlantic uh, just last year, the doctor doesn't listen to her, but the media is starting to. And what's happening is that this movement about women's health is aligning with the kind of activism that you see for ME-CFS and fibromyalgia and Lyme disease. Um, and the idea that there's a problem here is becoming, um, is organizing. So here's Selma Blair saying, uh, doctors didn't take my symptoms seriously for years, and here I am, very famous, glamorous movie star, with a cane because I actually have MS. Um, so you're starting to see these kinds of articles all over the news. This is becoming a thing. So uh, what's happening, I think, is that yeah, this phrase, MUS management, sounds so clinical and uh, so dull and so medical. But what's happening is that under so many different names, concern about this area of medicine is becoming a social justice issue. So why is this happening? Why has the medical profession accepted a model for managing uncertainty that fails the normal standards that we expect for rigor? So remember, here's what we're trying to figure out. Patient has a subjective experience. Doctor looks for objective evidence, doesn't find any. Assumes, based on guidelines, that when there's a lack of objective evidence, there's a lack of disease. Why do they accept that leap? I'm going to try and suggest that the, this leap is accepted as normal practice because the profession is very confused about what the term subjective means in the context of medicine. So I really am truly suggesting that all of this harm, all of this public unrest about the medical profession arises from a philosophical confusion about the difference between subjective and objective in the context of medical science. So I went looking on the internet for what everyday people say about subjective versus subjective, and I found this fantastic slide. <laughs> this is a slide, bizarrely, from a business marketing website. I really don't know why they would have addressed this issue on a business marketing website, but there you go. This slide tells us how the general public, how people typically think about the nature of medical science and what it means for something to be subjective and what it means for it to be objective. So here's Mr. Sadface fellow there in the middle. I have a pain in my back. On the right side, the patient says, I have a pain in my back. And oh, looky there, he's got a knife in his back. And so the doctor says, ah, you have stated some subjective evidence about your pain. And I have some objective evidence to verify your subjective statement because you got a knife right there in your back. So there you go. I accept this situation. On the left, same fella, same pain, same statement. The statement is subjective. But on this side, no knife in the back. So what should the doctor do then? That's just subjective evidence, right? So the way that market business news explains this, the doctor on the right has objective evidence that the patient has terrible pain. There's compelling evidence, because he can see the knife. The doctor on the left has subjective evidence, just the patient's word. And so he has to choose whether to believe the patient or not. 
because the evidence is just subjective, right? That's how it works in science generally. Subjective evidence is unscientific evidence, right? If medical science is just like the other sciences, then subjective experiences don't belong in the domain of medical science until they're verified by objective tests. That seems reasonable, right? That's what we do when we do science. From this perspective, subjective means, well, you haven't verified yet that yet. When you do science, you take one person's view on it, you investigate it from a whole lot of perspectives, you put a telescope out in the sky, you do a lot of different calculations, and you find some conclusion that's independent of any one personal perspective. So I just saw a new planet with my brand new telescope would be a subjective claim, but science has just verified the existence of a new planet would be an objective claim because it's not just one person's view, right? We've gone out and we've taken, we've gotten a sort of view from nowhere, a sort of everybody view, a view that doesn't depend on perspective. That tells us what's true. That's what science does. If that's how things really work in medicine, then this approach is exactly what we should be doing. Because when you lack objective evidence, you have failed to verify the subjective claim as true. The patient says, I feel a pain in my back. That's just subjective. The doctor goes and looks it up, finds no verification of that claim. So the doctor says, well, this is, you know, science has looked it up and found that there's nothing there, right? This is not a medical problem. If this is how subjectivity works in medicine, then we're doing this right. But there's another possibility. Sometimes the word subjective means private intrinsically private. So I could say, I have a pain in my back. That would be subjective. But an objective claim would be, the Earth orbits the sun, right? Why is I have a pain in my back subjective? Is it because it hasn't yet been verified by many people from many perspectives? No. It's because it's the kind of claim that cannot possibly be verified from many perspectives. When you say you have a pain in your back, you are making a claim about a private fact, a fact that can't possibly be verified from uh, multiple perspectives. So philosophers in the room might think, well, maybe what you mean is that subjective claims are not factual claims, right? So if I say to you, blue is the very best color, right? That's going to be a subjective claim. But it's not subjective because you didn't get enough scientists in the room to determine what the best color is. Right? It's subjective because you could get all the scientists in the world together. There's no answer to the question of what's the best color. That's a matter of taste. There's no fact of the matter. Is I have a pain in my back like that? Is it the case that there's no fact of the matter? Well, if you go back to this fellow here with the knife in his back, notice what the, what the statement is here. The doctor has to choose whether to believe the patient or not, right? It's possible to lie about your pain. If it's possible to misrepresent your pain, then we all believe there's a fact of the matter about your pain, right? If I get up on the witness stand and uh, I stand to make a million bucks by convincing the jury that I have a pain in my back, and I say, yes, yes, back hurts really, really bad, this is terrible, is the jury thinking, well, I like pain. Some people like pain, some people don't, it's a matter of taste. No. Are they thinking, well, who's to say whether you have pain or not? What's pain anyway? No. What they're thinking is, do you have pain or do you not have pain? Are you telling the truth or are you lying? So the jury, just like the doctor, recognizes the, your pain as a matter of fact. Either you are having pain or you're not having pain. It's just a matter of fact that cannot be accessed with objective evidence. When we see this correctly, we see I have a pain in my back is a factual statement a statement that belongs in the domain of science. 
It's just a kind of fact that cannot possibly be accessed except from the first person perspective. I have a pain in my back, can be true or false. It just cannot be evaluated in the way that we evaluate the Earth and the sun. Because you can only determine whether there's a pain in the back if it's your back. So it's an unusual kind of fact. I want to suggest that the practice of medicine is a science of private facts. What we do in the practice of medicine is we study the subject matter of experience. That is what medicine does. The subject matter of medicine is your private experience. As an applied science, medicine sets out to improve experience, and medicine wants to preserve experience by protecting life. But if medicine thinks that there's no fact of the matter about whether you're having pain, there's no fact of the matter about whether you're feeling ill, medicine as a science dissolves. This is the definition of what we do in medicine. We understand, investigate, and improve subjective facts. So bodily experience is not subjective because we haven't verified it scientifically. Bodily experience is subjective because it's private by nature. It's intrinsically private. These are facts that can't be accessed by others. Once we recognize this, we see that the patient's subjective experience is already in the domain of science. It is a factual matter. It's just a factual matter that's very hard to consider, unless it's your own experience. So when you're lacking objective evidence, that's no indication whatsoever that disease is not present. Absolutely none. But once you adjust your understanding of what's subjective and objective, you find that this everyday practice just can't be defended. So if you approach this area of medicine based on a philosophical understanding of what's subjective and objective, you recognize the limitations of medical science. In other words, you recognize that we get it wrong most of the time, much of the time. Medicine is deeply flawed. You recognize that bodily experience is a matter of scientific fact, regardless of the presence of objective evidence. And then you do medical research that helps you figure out rigorous, safety-tested methods for dealing with subjective experience of illness and suffering that doesn't lead to objective evidence. And that's it. Medicine's task in this context is to proceed scientifically with matters of fact that it cannot possibly access. So medical science is a very unique kind of science with a very unique kind of challenge. That's it. Thank you. I can do it, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Subjective evidence can be verified. And I'll give you an example. A husband wants to go into business with another man, and his wife says, I have a bad feeling about that guy. And he goes into business with the other man, and it's terrible. Uh -huh. Now, that was subjective, her feeling. That's subjective evidence. And the husband may say to her, but OK, what evidence do you have that this guy and I there's going to be problems. She says, all I got is a feeling. Yes. Oh. Uh, just, just a moment, okay? Because yes. I, want, I want to run this through to how it applies to medicine specifically. Yes. Okay, so the wise man oh, says, I should listen to my wife. Because she has something. <laughs> That's probably usually true. Something I yeah. can't see. But the yeah. foolish husband says, it wasn't her intuition. Right. That was superstition. Yes. All it was, was you know, we didn't have enough capital or we made this mistake right. or whatever. He's looking for all kinds of things. But the true reason yes. he won't say it was her intuition that yes. was correct is because he doesn't have the intuition. Right. And that's how it applies to the medical community. Right. They don't have that. They can't control it, so they deny it. Yes. But there is evidence. Well, the thing there is to ask whether you have ever accessed your wife's experience. And the answer to that question is no. Your wife has an experience of your situation, 
and an experience of your decision making about business and experience of your connections and whatnot. She can report to you about her experience and she can point to things in the world that might support it or she can just attribute it to things that she doesn't understand. And you can understand everything she says, but can you experience her experience? That's what I'm saying. Now, think it's about the difference there. It's not that, it's not, I'm not asking, can you find evidence that validates her experience? Yeah. I'm asking, can you experience her experience? Well, that's my point, though. Yeah. The evidence is, so he goes into business with another okay. person. She says, I have a good feeling, and it works out great. And he denies that it had anything to do with her intuition. More and more evidence keeps piling up, and he still keeps denying it. Why? Because think he doesn't have that intuition. Think about it like this. You go into surgery, and uh, you, you uh, are sent into the recovery room, and you wake up. And what's the first thing that happens when you recover from a surgery? What does somebody say to you? You cry. <laughs> somebody says to you, how do you feel? How do you feel? Right? How are you? How's it, how are you feeling? Suppose you feel really awful, and it hurts to talk, and you're, you're a testy person anyway. Can you just go, just look at the machine? What are you asking me for? Can you do that? So what if you're, you have a really serious operation, you end up in the ICU, you're attached to a gazillion machines, they all give very intricate information with numbers about how your health is doing, what your body's doing. You wake up in the ICU, what's the first thing that happens? They say, how do you feel? Why do they ask you that? Because there is nothing, no matter how much information you get on those machines, that tells them your experience, right? There is nothing that medicine could do. Even if you got a completely full, complete, detailed picture of your brain, and you were able to predict what your brain's going to do in the next moment successfully at all times, then would you have access to experience? No. No. Yeah. Um, just a few seconds. I just want clarification on one thing. Sure. So are you suggesting that doctors, um, because they're not believe, are, are you suggesting that they don't believe the person's subjective experience and therefore are saying that there's no disease? I just want to clarify that that's what you're saying. I, I, I want to say that I don't think that, I mean, the guidelines aren't suggesting. You, you said it out as you, they believe, you, you, they're believed or not believed in terms of one of your slides. So yeah. Based on that slide, are you suggesting that if the doctor is not finding a right. disease because right. the person says that they're sick yeah. and that they're hurting, yeah. then you're saying that the only reason why they're not finding a disease or doing anything about it is because they don't believe the person. Well, I think the doctors believe that the patient's having the experience. I don't think the doctors doubt that the experience is occurring. But they have this model of medical science where they think that the experience is only real or genuine or scientific once I verify it with my objective test. What do your words mean by when you say real and genuine? Yes, that's a very, it's a very tricky, yes, so yes. Done, Not done. medical science. What is that? Yes, well, that's exactly my point. Okay. So yeah. But the point is, so and. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're, it's, basically, it sounds to me like you're saying that, like, that, that, it's, that they don't believe. Which, which, which is fair, fair enough. Yeah. But, you know, just, so just to say that. Um, number two, um, just if you, you, you might be interested in this, that um, um, <clears throat> the courts actually yeah. are starting to accept uh, a diagnosis of a pain condition yeah. without any uh, pain, pain, uh, pain disorder, right. without any um, objective evidence yes. in the courts. Yes. Um, and if there are some phys physiatrists who are diagnosing that. Oh, yes. People are getting, yes. Um, they're, they're getting yes. Yes, this is exactly right, and it's really important. The courts are beginning to, people are beginning to challenge the idea that when objective is, evidence is lacking, people aren't really sick. In the court, in the legal system, that is changing. Yes, true. And I yes. Just, I, I just want to make yes. a, another point from the other perspective, mm -hmm. because it seems like you're also um, debasing a little bit the psychiatric side of it. Mm. You're saying yes. that if they don't have an illness, we send the psychiatrist, and, and right. I think you're a little, you might be playing into that um, um, 
Anti psychiatry, they call that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You're, you're, you're playing yes. stigma by saying that yes. nothing's happening there. Right. So, and, and, um, okay. So, and, and another point, my belief is yes. that point. My, yes. my belief is that all of psychiatry is psychosomatic. That depression, anxiety, there's no difference between that than yes. it is with, with, with somatoform disorders. It's all physical symptoms yes. that we can find a physical cause. Yes. And we call it psychiatric. Yes. Yes, I, yes, I'm with you on that. That's a very tricky issue, that mind-body issue. Um, let, let me, yes. Yes, I'm with you on that. Yes. Do the, does the research, when they follow up on cases of MUS, yeah. does the research show any pattern of what patients do when they are then told there's no objective evidence, go home, forget about it? Yes. What fraction of patients do go home? And say, oh well, the doctor says there's nothing wrong, so I'm yeah. okay. and then they never complain again. Yes, uh, right. Does that happen? Uh, uh, no. Um, that's what uh, <laughs> that picture of the woman going. That that's a standard. So all of the research in this area shows that when the doctor says, yeah, I didn't find anything, so there's nothing wrong with you, just accept that. Um, patients just say, shut up. Patients no. Patients don't accept that. So patients argue, patients demand more medical care, patients insist the doctor is doing a bad job, patients get frustrated, patients drop out of the med medical system entirely and get diseases that they don't get care for, all kinds of bad reactions. Um, but one thing we know for sure is that care in this area is people aren't getting better. Sure. People are not getting better. And so uh, is there any yeah. estimate of how much this is costing us to treat these Cases? Yes, this is the most expensive symptom group in medicine. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's proven that if you route all of these patients into psychiatric care, it's less expensive. <laughs> uh, of course it is. Uh, so in the UK, patients who have MUS are immediately routed into psychological therapies. Uh, and this is kind of taking off in Europe. And there's some question that it might take off in Canada. Um, yes. I wish that were true. Uh, when I first started working in this area, I, I thought that might be the case. But it turns out that um, when uh, that female doctors make th accept these practice guidelines as often as male doctors, I don't think there's any difference there. Yeah. The second point was, um, what about diagnosis by exclusion? Yeah. You mentioned that some doctors don't like to not know. Right. But Right. Well, it must be this. Right. So that's what you got. So, you know. Right. Um, is that like uh, falling out of MUS, or is it just like probably you do have that <coughs> option, but there's no evidence, and they'll say you'll get over it? Well, um, I mean, that's kind of what MUS is. I, I looked for all these things, I didn't find anything. The word for that is MUS, and oh, look, that's classified in psychiatry. I mean, that's kind of how it works. Um, I think that what you need is a scientific way of managing cases where you don't have objective evidence. So how often do these patients have diseases? Uh, when is it safe to assume there's not a disease? When is it safe to do wait and watch? When should you do more tests? You need medical research to, to work out a, a safe method for dealing with that. But at this time, we don't have any medical research because this is all handled in psychiatry. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned that. Um doctor-patient friction uh, is a big problem that a lot of studies are being done in that area. Yeah. To what extent are doctors uh, taking a look at the results of that and perhaps recognizing, hey, if tier one is the look for objective evidence, right. oh, but if I don't find it, that, that was tier one. Now tier two should be mm -hmm. autoimmune and yeah. diseases yeah. before we go to uh, psychiatric. That's so a, to yes. what extent is, is that being recognized and also would you say that it's um, more of a, uh, uh, how, do we need to change ourselves or is it just, what do we have to say to shut these people up? You mean the patient? Yeah. <laughs> uh, on the first question, that's exactly what should happen. We need research on MUS with, with patients who have autoimmune disease. What happens if you have an autoimmune disease, the doctor doesn't see anything, she says MUS, you don't get care. 
We need research that explains what happens in those cases, what happens to rare disease patients. There is no research of that kind because right, this is all handled in psychiatry. So. Mostly, uh, yeah. To whatever extent the progress is, yeah. it's, hey, at least now we're recognizing it as psychiatric, even if that's wrong 50% of the time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But the, th the thing is that. Well, it's 25% less bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, patients who have these kinds of con conditions that are commonly mistaken for psychosomatic conditions, uh, I mean, it's, it's reasonable for people to think, well, have you ruled those things out? And at this point, the practice guidelines, the answer to that is no. There's been no effort whatsoever to rule that out. There's been no effort to rule out gender bias. All of these guidelines just proceed as if these kind, this kind of evidence is not occurring, right? So. Um, Answer to that is yes, that's how to do it, and no, we're not doing that. Maybe that should be, yeah. part, if not part of the protocol for first opinion, it's right. part of the protocol for second opinion. It should be, though I, I really should point out that um, studies show that doctors don't like these guidelines. Uh, studies show that most of the time doctors say, what, I'm supposed to say that they're not sick just because I didn't see the evidence? So much of the research in psychosomatic medicine uh, is about convincing doctors to stop looking into it because doctors are much more cautious than these guidelines suggest. Uh, so there's evidence that, that doctors are as uncomfortable with this as patients are. But this is the most frustrating area of practice for doctors, by far, without any subtlety there. This is the most frustrating area of practice uh, for doctors and the reason why there's a GP shortage by many uh, standards. So it's not like doctors are sitting around trying to figure out how to do this better, right? Everyone hates this area of practice. Right? So it's just, those are the patients I don't understand. Those are the patients who get mad at me. Those are the patients where I fail. Right? So we don't, we're not trying very hard to, to work it out. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's very reasonable, and it's absolutely clear that women seek medical care more often than men. There's no question that that's true. But the fact is that women do not get ill less often than men. In fact, there's a, pro there's a disparity, a, a, a paradox in healthcare where women get ill more often but die less often in the same circumstances. So uh, greater morbidity, lower mortality. So it's kind of a paradox. So there isn't any question that women need medical care as often as men. So but if they go twice as much, right? And they, and they and they and we're saying, oh, but you only need it half the time. Half the time you were wrong. Well, that scans. Well, I mean, what happens? The half that they don't need it is well, they don't they go, go twice as much first. But what happens if women go to the doctor and and they have an illness, and the doctor says, well, it's ten times more likely that you're not actually sick than if you were a man, and so you don't have a problem. What does she do next? Go to a woman doctor. <laughs> This, this actually doesn't help. But what she does next is she goes to another doctor, right? So this problem makes it necessary for women to keep going to doctors. So this problem actually explains why women go to doctors more often. So it, we have this stereotype that women are more communicative about their symptoms, and women tend to be more sensitive to their bodies, these kinds of things. But in reality, women actually become ill more often than men. But if doctors routinely assume that women's symptoms are not caused by medical conditions, of course they have to go to the doctor more often. What else are they going to do, right? So my, my mother's yeah. chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. So, okay. so both chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia are, are deemed to be more prevalent in women than yeah. men in yeah. the research. But yeah. how true is that? How close is it more equal than the It's true. Autoimmune diseases are 75% women. 
there, there are uh, women's health conditions. Women tend to have more chronic diseases than men. That's why you have a greater morbidity, lower mortality, because women suffer from chronic illness a great deal more often than men. That's not a, a like a. Yeah, but there is actually a biological difference in, yeah. Yeah. Well, there are some issues b between uh, women's reproductive systems and autoimmune disease. There are some uh, suggestions that the nature of women's bodies leads to chronic illness. Uh, I mean, Genetic. you know, biologically, women are different from men. So there, there is a lot of research that suggests that for example, the, the gender disparity in autoimmune disease disappears uh, in young in children and in postmenopausal women. So, so women yeah. More vulnerable than men, but the cause to both yeah. the whole population of these like chronically prevalent is the same, which is all kinds of causes. Of it could be. Stress, yes. The list goes on. It could be, although there's a, a great deal of biological. Yeah, there's a lot of biological research now on MECFS that suggests it does. It isn't about stress at all. It's actually a, a yeah, yeah, or maybe a disorder of your cells or something like that. Yeah. 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 Wow. Hooray. <laughs> Great question. Um, well, one thing that women often say on the internet is if you have symptoms that haven't been explained, make sure you take a man next time when you go to the doctor. Uh, because doctors will, will say, and women often, I mean, it's anecdotal, but women on the internet will often say, yeah, doctor didn't understand my symptoms, so he asked the guy with me. Uh, <laughs> so there's that. Um, I think that. Um, I, I wish I had, I mean, in general, what can anybody do to fix this problem? I, the kind of patient activism that's occurring in the, with contested conditions and with women's health is as important as it could be. I think that kind of activis activism, kind of public involvement in equitable medical care, um, just generally talking um, amongst people about this as an issue, as a social justice issue, I think these kinds of things are making a really big difference. Yes, yes. Um, why, why are women more likely to be diagnosed with MS than U.S. women? Hmm. Big question. Um, in the 1900s, in the 1800s, um, uh, psychiatrists, neurologists, worked on a diagnosis called hysteria that was considered to be a female disease. And um, mm, as I, I kept pointing to that word hysteria and saying, you know, I'm not really going to talk about that. Um, it, that diagnosis encouraged doctors to attribute everything they didn't understand about women's health to mental health problems. And that's just kind of how medicine did it for a long, long time. Um, and what's happening now is that we're realizing that that's causing problems for women, that women are having a really hard time getting the medical care they need because those models are still in place and nobody's talking about them. Um, but that's actually a lot more complicated. That's a really good question. Yeah. Is that it? Any other questions? Yeah. Just one quick comment. I, yeah. I'd, I'd like to defend doctors a little bit. Sure. Um, being a guy, I'm a psychologist, I've been working for 25 years. Yeah. And uh, when I first started out, I would agree with you completely. I used to have people come into my office all the time, yeah. saying that their doctors didn't believe them with respect to their pain conditions or with respect to their physical symptoms. And it's rare that I hear that today. What I hear today is doctors saying they don't know what's going on. That's great. Maybe this could help. Yes. So I honestly do think times are changing. Yes, I think so too. I, I think so too. I just I gave a talk last week at the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine, and just my presence there um, w w marks a big change. I, um, that organization is an amazing organization that's trying to address a diagnostic error, 
and my presence there signaled the, the, the fact that medicine is becoming open to the idea that this is an error-prone area. Um, and I, I, do, I think you're exactly right about that. This is a, a change that, that is occurring. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, you didn't mention the word hypochondria. Is it the yeah. same thing as in the US? Or yes. Or you draw a line between them? They just change the terminology in the DSM all the time. So back in before 2013, hypochondria was a term in the, in the mental health manual. And it's a term that uh, anybody my age is used to hearing. Uh, when somebody's you know, in a sitcom, there's somebody who's complaining all the time, and uh, the doctors can't explain it. That person's a hypochondriac. They just changed the terminology. So now we have somatic symptom disorder and health anxiety. Uh, health anxiety is just where you stress about health all the time, the possibility of getting ill, but you're not fixating on your own symptoms. If you're fixating on your own symptoms and there's no objective evidence, then that's somatic symptom disorder. Yeah. Yes. Um, just kind of struggling with this idea that you, you, you provided, uh, I don't know if you could go back to that one slide where you said mm. you thought it was a daunting task ah, yes. for uh, My favorite. doctors. Yes. That, that statement. Yes. Medicine's daunting task is to proceed scientifically with matters of fact that cannot possibly act as directly. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like this is kind of un unfair. You're, you're, you're saying, hey, researchers, I want you to research something that no matter what you say, I'm going to say you didn't get the answer because it's not answerable, really. Ah, Can you I see. Can you get actually I see. Right. You're asking, I mean, almost right. for perfect empathy that right. nobody can get to. That's really a so good, how you, yes, how you right. How propose, actually, yes. this be researched? I mean, you gave examples yes. of things that were considered in MUS right. that then transitioned. Was it an accident that it was found? How did, what was right. the procedure to go from fibromyalgia yes. to um, cells don't work because this molecule right. is wrong? Right. Like, how, how are we going to find it? Well, you have a lot of different questions there. I think the one, uh, the question you're asking is really, really uh, pressing is, this idea that, well, medicine is failing because it's not, under, it's not having enough empathy, it's not uh, understanding that experience is genuine. That's not actually what, I'm, what I mean to say, though I get that that's what my words are saying. So it makes sense that you would conclude that. Um, what I mean to suggest is that uh, all of our experiences are private, right? Like, I have an experience at this moment. I could relay it to you. But no matter what I say, my words are going to be small, right? Because you cannot access my experience. Even if I want you to access it, you cannot. You want to tell me your experience, I can listen intently, I can be empathetic, I can do everything I can possibly do to understand your experience, but can I access it? No, never. This is the human condition. We are experiencers. All of our experience is private. We cannot share experience with one another. That's the nature of experience. Medicine is a science that addresses experience. So it is intrinsically challenged in this way. Right? What medicine is trying to do is to improve experiences, but it can never access them directly. Not because it's not empathetic enough, because it's impossible. Right? Nobody can access anybody else's experience. That's what it means to be a person. I have a good answer to that. <laughs> okay. To the central nervous system, we don't have the understanding of the tools strong enough at yeah. least to access mm -hmm. and, and, and diagnose the differences between all our individual nervous systems and yes. relate it to the causes of this. If I could, yes. If I could just say it again. Yeah, just hold on one second. Try to imagine what it would be like if you were able to bring in a perfect future neurologist. A neurologist, maybe a neurologist that has a view of your brain that's as good as God's. A, a neuro, no, one sec. A neurologist that has a perfect understanding of every detail of your brain down to the atoms. And this neurologist can predict exactly what will happen in your brain from moment to moment accurately. Will that doctor know your experience? Well, 
No. Well, so this is actually why I mentioned major league distribution. You said this now twice. Yes. Said no, and I disagreed. I, I don't see how you're getting to know. Why do you say no? There's no need to understand it perfectly. Better, we better, better need to understand it a yeah. lot better. Sure. What I'm saying we're understanding it from the real one. I'd like to understand what you what you mean. You, you said it was we have a perfect understanding of this individual. Of the brain. Okay. The of brain. the brain. Yes. I mean, I, I'm saying it's the same as the ICU situation, right? You're in the ICU. You have all the machines telling you exactly all the details of what's going on in your body. But what's the first thing the doctor does when she enters the room and you've woken up? There's something she needs to know. Well, that's because our technology isn't there yet. But you're assuming when we no, get there. No, no, no. No, all, of, all gonna you're going to get from the in. machines is images and numbers, right? There's a fundamental difference between images and numbers and experience, right? When, when you're substantial nigra is missing, we know that's why you're not able to walk very well. So the numbers and kind of tell you something sometimes. Of course they do, yes. The numbers tell you something, but the numbers do not give you the experience, right? There's a fundamental difference between numbers and experiences, right? That's why you're not a machine, right? OK, so yes. what do you do? Sorry, yes. So maybe we need big epidemiological studies about what, what, what constitutes these uh, medically unexplainable symptoms. Yes. Because if you forget about what an experience is and just say what do people yeah. say when they come in yeah. to the doctor's office, yeah. and, and you start to look at the big picture stuff and crunch the big numbers, you find that 80% yeah. of the people that say, I have a sore back, that can't be explained with anything else. Mm -hmm. It turns out uh, when, you, when you look at aggregate the data that it, it turns out that a quite a good number of them uh, you know have a certain muscle that's full right things like that and, and it's impossible to scan and right out. so I mean these sorts of things could certainly help yes uh, uh, there are studies like that where, yes obviously from what you said they're not it's just unfortunately there are some conditions many conditions because medical science is is far more flawed than we're willing to accept oh, no. back conditions lower back pain we just don't have any there's no evidence to explain that. But anybody who's ever had lower back pain knows if, if you have lower back pain, you have lower back pain, right? It, it's just that we don't have the medical diagnostic tests are, are, are really a very clumsy tool. And there's going to be a whole lot of them that don't, a whole lot of symptoms that don't ultimately get explained. But you're right. What we need exactly is that studies that, um, might help. yes, it would definitely help. Was there anybody else new? Quantum computing. Yes. So, Wayne, did you have a question? No? Okay. So, I think we're going to thank our speaker. Thank you.